good morning good morning everyone my name is Shannon Burton and I'm the principal of Lord Selkirk Elementary it is my honor to welcome all of you here today I would like to recognize that we live work and play on the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish Tsleil-Waututh and Coast Salish nations Welcome to all of our students, staff, and community members. I would like to acknowledge Vancouver School Board Associate Superintendent Rob Schindel, Aaron Davis, Director of Instruction, and Vancouver School Board Trustees Janet Fraser and Lois Chan Pedley, who are here with us today. We would also like to welcome Luke Simard, Director General of the National Research Council's Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Centre. Welcome to Joshua Kutrick, an astronaut with the Canadian Space Agency who is our special guest. Thank you to all these honored guests for joining us and supporting this exciting educational experience for our students and community. Finally, welcome to everyone who is joining us online. The Canadian Space Agency is collabor collaborating with the European Space Agency and Kids Code Jeunesse to bring AstroPi to Canada we are fortunate ha to have the Canadian Space Agency and Kid Codes Jeunesse with us today. Students have worked on a unique challenge that could take the code they have written into space. This project has allowed students to engage in innovative learning, providing them with an opportunity to connect te technology to real life experiences. The Vancouver School District recognizes the emphasis on digital literacy in BC's new curriculum. So together with partners, the district has expanded digital learning initiatives that provide students with greater 21st century learning opportunities. It is these partnerships with community organizations that provide both teacher development and educational experiences for students that all enhance their learning journey. We know that behind educational experiences such as this one are amazing educators. The team at Lord Selkirk has eagerly embarked on Astro Pi Mission Zero with their students. Thank you to teacher librarian, Madame Astrid, Mr. Dominic, the vice principal, and the Selkirk teachers, Mr. Hoffman, Mr. Cho, Madame Michelle, Madame Cynthia, Ms. Kushnerick, and Ms. Chan, and Ms. Smith, and Mrs. Smith. Without their enthusiasm and interest, this project would not have happened. Shortly, we will have a chance to get the first live connection in British Columbia with Canadian Space Agency astronaut David St. Jock. He will respond to student questions directly from the International Space Station. Without further ado, please welcome Ms. Indra Kubitschek, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer at Kids Code Chines. Thank you, Ms. Burton, for the introduction. Bonjour à tous. Je suis ravi d'être avec vous aujourd'hui pour lancer le défi AstroPi au Canada. I'm here from Kids Code Jeunesse, a not-for-profit organization that wants to make sure that you are able to create, communicate, and innovate with technology. The AstroPi challenge brings space and coding together. At Kids Code Jeunesse, we believe this is the perfect way to inspire young people to acquire the skills needed to thrive in a digital future. This Code in the Stars initiative was created by Kids Code Jeunesse in collaboration with the Canadian Space Agency. It leverages the European AstroPi Challenge to spark an interest in space exploration and make coding accessible to everyone. Mission Zero is the entry-level AstroPi activity. Student teams write a simple code to display a message for astronauts on the AstroPi computer aboard the space station. No special equipment or prior coding skills are needed, and all entries that follow program rules are guaranteed to be run in space. European astronaut Alexander Gerst started this year's competition, and Canadian astronaut David St. Jacques will continue the good work of Alex for AstroPi on board the space station. 
International collaboration provides opportunities for countries like Canada to participate in these awe-inspiring programs. With this hands-on activity, young Canadians like you have the opportunity to learn coding and other digital skills. And just imagine your code will run in space while Canadian Space Agency astronaut David St. Jacques is up there. By learning to code, you'll be able to build and create all sorts of cool things. You might even build the next Fortnite or Instagram. I'd like to finish by giving a huge thank you to both the staff and students of Lord Selkirk Elementary for taking part in this activity with us. It is evident that so much passion and energy has gone into making today possible. And I would now like to, and I would now like to invite Madame Astrid to tell us a bit more about our unplugged activity. Merci beaucoup, thank you. everybody. I am excited to invite Ms. Smith and Division 11 to come up to the front. So Mrs. Smith and Division 11 have prepared for you today an unplugged activity. An unplugged activity is a fun and easy way to introduce students um, to the basic fundamental concepts of coding without using computers. It teaches them how to take big problems and break them down into smaller steps. Their challenge was to create a beating heart using only people and paper. We hope you will enjoy Selkirk's beating heart. Thank you so much, Division 11. That was fantastic. You can take a bow. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Joshua Kutrick and Viduni and Yona, if you would please come up to the front. <laughs> Test pilot and fighter pilot Joshua Kutrick has flown over 25 aircraft. He was recruited by the Canadian Space Agency in 2017 as he's taking a short break today to spend some time at this event with us. We are thrilled to have you today, Joshua. I'm thrilled to be here, thank you. Over the course of the last few months, the students at Selkirk Elementary have had an opportunity to learn coding facilitated by mentors from Kids Code Jeunesse 
and from their teachers as well. We'd like, we wouldn't have been able to do this without the help of all our mentors from Kids Coach Ines, Mavis, Yasmin, Sam, Abderame, Pranav, Leo, and even volunteers from Van Tech Secondary School, Pew. The Astro Pi Mission Zero project um, is a way for students to experience coding um, and they have been given a mission to brighten the daily routine of astronauts on the ISS. Although uh, over 130 students participated in this project, you can see them all with blue shirts today, and they've all created fantastic projects that they can all be proud of and that will be sent up to the ISS. We have chosen two students today to talk about their project. Yona and Viduni, we chose your project not only because you responded to all the cri required criteria, but also because we felt that your message was heartwarming. So congratulations, and we hope that you'll tell us a little bit about your project. Viduni. My name is Yona. And we all just um, felt like a message that we can. Um, we thought it'd be fun to just send a message saying you inspire us all in French. Nous vous inspirez too is the message we sent. Yeah, that's, uh, thanks for sharing that. I'm looking at your script behind you, and I, I really like it. I'm uh, not a pro coder, but I've done some. Um, so it looks good, and thanks for doing it. How did you, how did, why did you choose that message? Maybe I'd ask. We thought it'd be nice for an astronaut who's away in space to hear something nice. I'm and we thought that uh, maybe he, we want him to know that we're really proud of him. His nation, his whole nation is proud of him. And that he's showing the younger generation that you, we can accomplish so many things, even if they're so far away. Yeah, I think you're right. Thank you. And uh, I know David quite well. We're going to talk to him here in a few minutes, but he'd be, he'd be thrilled and heart, heart warm to share that. So thanks for saying it. Are we going to, we have it playing on the screen, right? I think, yeah, you see it, very nice. I think that this is a, by the way, just to talk a little bit about coding, I think it's a, an awesome program. Um, you know, coding is just so important. It's fundamental to everything we do in science and engineering and technology, and it's especially fundamental to space exploration, which we, maybe we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, I wanted to ask you, ask you too, while we still have you on the stage, how did you come across this? Who gave you this idea, and, and how were you, how did you come across this idea of uh, the Astro Pi Challenge and, and become motivated to do it? Um, well, it started with um, our teacher. She showed us the video of um, the Chris Hadfield yeah. um, video um, when he was in the ISS, and then she explained to us what was the challenge, what was the objective, and um, that like we were going to do it in the language Python and yeah, yeah. Yeah. our class was taking part in the Astro Pi challenge. So we just found a way to make it our own and unique. Well thank you for doing it. Have you got have you by the way coded before or is this your first try <laughs> at it? Um, it was my first time coding using Python. Um, with me, it's not, it's definitely not my first time. I've made like websites, games, apps. That's and amazing. And, <laughs> and I participated in a robotics competition in grade three. 
and I was able to get third place on the international level. Holy wow. Congratulations. And you have a bright future in coding, <laughs> I think, if you continue to, to nurture that talent. Yeah, a round of applause. Th thank you, Abaduni and Jonah, for, for sharing with us this morning. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks so much. And I, I think everybody knows, but it, de it deserves reinforcement, this, uh, because it's, it's really neat even for me to think about the fact that all this code that is being generated by youth interested in coding now because of the AstroPy Challenge is actually being run on a, a little computer on the, the space station. Um, which is just fundamentally awesome. It's a great thing. So we're uh, privileged, happy to be here, I would say, for myself. Um, I'm happy any time I get to be in a room of, of people who are excited about science and technology and coding. Um, and so I would say thank you for your interest and thank you for being here. I'm just going to talk for a few quick minutes. Uh, basically, we're filling. So I think that you know what's going on this morning. We're going to talk to uh, my colleague, friend, and Canadian Space Agency astronaut David St. Jacques via downlink uh, direct through mission control in Houston to us. And we're going to do that in a few minutes. Um, I wanted to introduce you to some of the, the others who work with us down in Houston. I came in last night from Houston. I live and work at the Johnson Space Center uh, training for space flight. I've been training for a year and a half, and I got a lot, a lot further to go. People train, as a matter of fact, for between, uh, it can be as many as five years for a specific mission. So it's a very long road. Space flight's a very challenging and, and difficult thing still. In this picture, you see me. You see uh, other Canadian Space Agency astronauts, Jenny Seide, Gibbons, and uh, Jeremy Hansen. We're doing some microgravity training here. We're in an airplane uh, that uses aggressive flight profiles as it goes up and down, up and down like a roller coaster to expose us to microgravity uh, at different intervals so that we can prepare and practice operating in that environment. It's a lot different. You also. Um, I guess we're going to look at a picture of the MBL. This is something where I spend a lot of time. I was in there this week. I'll be in there next week. But what we're doing here is we're operating in a, a neutrally buoyant environment. So we're operating underwater to simulate space flight. We go into this pool. It's a giant, maybe the biggest pool in the world. Um, it has uh, a whole bunch of the space station inside it. And we run through technical procedures in there for up to six or seven hours. So. I just want to throw some of that out there in terms of what we do when we're, when we're not up here uh, talking to you people. Let's go to this. I'm getting uh, messaging. We're going to hopefully have David on the line here in about two minutes. But real quick before we do, I was going to show you how David got to space. He's been there for about two months now. And uh, this is what he launched on. So this is a Soyuz rocket in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. I was fortunate enough to be there to see him off. And uh, I tell you, it's just a wonderful experience to actually see this rocket work. You get to be with David during the day. The three crew go out to that rocket. They climb to the top of it. They sit, just three little tiny humans on the end of this absolutely magnificent, awe-inspiring piece of technology. And then everybody else leaves. And we walk over a mile away. And then someone, one person with a very important job, hits the go button, and it lights. And I've seen lots of rocket launches on video, but when you see this in person, it gives you a whole new appreciation for space flight and for still how difficult and I would say risky and dangerous, but vitally important human exploration of space is. We launched David. We saw him go off. We actually saw him at night about uh, 90 minutes later as he came back over Baikonur in his Soyuz. And by that time, he had already, he was close to approaching this. This, you would all recognize the International Space Station. It's maybe the most complex piece of technology ever built by humankind. Uh, I study it on a daily basis, so I can testify to its complexity. It's a crown achievement of our species, and it's, it's just absolutely wonderful the kind of work we're doing on it. It's absolutely wonderful uh, that as our small little country of Canada, we're playing such an important role in it. Um, so that's some. where I live and work, and uh, right away we're going to get uh, the phone link set up the to the space station. station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. I am ready. Houston, this is station. I am ready. Canadian Space Agency, this is Mission Control Houston. Please Canadian call Space Agency, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. 
Uh, good morning, Station. This is Canadian Space Agency astronaut Joshua Kutrick here in Vancouver. Hello, David. How do you hear us? Hey, Josh. I hear you loud and clear. Hey, Josh. I'm ready to speak I hear with you, you loud and clear. I'm ready to speak with you. Okay, so we hear you loud and clear. It's, uh, it's wonderful to to see you and to talk to you. I haven't seen you in two months. Um, I hear things are going well. I hope they're going well. You're, you're, there's three of you in that giant station right now. How's the mission going and how are you enjoying all the extra space? Yeah, it's a busy time, of course, because we have to take care of this big station. There's only three of us, uh, but that means that we can do things our own way. Uh, so there's some nice aspects to it. And of course, uh, the views are incredible, and one day you will see those views too, Josh. Uh, every time I swing by the cupola and I can look at the Earth, uh, it just uh, blows me away. Okay. Well, uh, we're very fortunate to have you on the line. Thank you for taking the time, David. And um, I think we'll cut straight to the program. Uh, so you, you know what we're doing. We're launching the AstroPi Challenge here in Canada, the coding challenge for young people um, in different countries of the world, including ours. And uh, I'm here in Vancouver at the Lord Selkirk uh, Elementary School with a whole bunch of people who are absolutely fascinated and excited by the work that you're doing on the station right now. And I have a whole lineup of uh, children with some, some questions to ask you. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask on behalf of someone it comes from Sam, who lives in Quebec, but isn't here with us this morning. And his question to you, David, is uh, what is the thing that you miss the most about Earth? Well, it's the people that I love uh, that I had to leave behind, well, of course, that I miss. Everything is amazing here, but, you know, every day I miss my family, I miss my friends. And I will see them again, and I will have nice stories for them. I wish I could bring them here. I will have nice stories for them, but if I, I wish I could bring them here. Thank you for the answer. I think I could do that with this microphone in my hand, but I'm, I'm going to try that later. And we're going to go to questions. Um, so here, here's your first question from uh, one of our students here, David. I'm going to hand him, I'll hold the mic for you. How about that? And just go nice and loud. Bonjour, Capitaine. Je m'appelle Owen et je suis en cinquième année. Ma question est, est-ce que les astronautes doivent savoir comment coder? Bonjour Owen. Oui, tous les astronautes savent coder un petit peu parce que la plupart des astronautes ont étudié euh, euh, comment coder dans, durant leurs études. Et c'est utile parce que des fois on a à coder, mais souvent on a à utiliser les ordinateurs. Et quand on sait comment coder, on comprend comment les ordinateurs fonctionnent. Et ça nous permet d'éviter des erreurs, ça nous permet de les réparer. Donc tout le monde doit savoir coder. Thank you, very much. Thank, you. Thank you, David. Uh, we have our second question on the way, right here. Bonjour, je suis Rhys dans septième année, et mon question est pourquoi est-ce important que les enfants apprennent à coder? Question importante, Rhys. Tu sais, les ordinateurs sont déjà partout dans notre vie, même dans nos téléphones maintenant, bientôt dans nos réfrigérateurs. Vous, votre génération, au, tout va avoir un ordinateur à l'intérieur. Et c'est très important de bien comprendre comment ça fonctionne pour euh, être le maître de toutes ces machines. Et aussi, coder, ça apprend la pensée analytique. Et ça apprend aussi le travail d'équipe, parce que c'est toujours fait en équipe, des machines compliquées comme ça. Donc, je pense que c'est important pour les jeunes d'apprendre à coder, d'apprendre comment fonctionnent les ordinateurs pour être confortable avec eux, parce qu'ils font partie de notre vie, surtout maintenant avec le développement d'intelligence artificielle. Ça va être de plus en plus important dans notre vie, tout ce qui est informatique. Tout ce qui est informatique. Là, 
Merci beaucoup. La prochaine question. Bonjour, je m'appelle Christina et je suis en septième année. Je veux savoir combien de temps ton corps a-t-il pris pour s'adapter à la microgravité? Christina, ça m'a pris plus, quelques semaines avant d'être vraiment à l'aise. Au début, j'avais la tête un peu gonflée parce que le sang monte à la tête. C'est comme si tu t'accroches comme ça au plafond, à l'envers. Moi, ici, dans l'espace, ça ne fait pas de différence. Mais quand je suis arrivé, ça faisait une différence et j'étais euh, toujours congestionné. Mais maintenant, je suis complètement adapté. Je peux être dans tous les sens. Ça ne me fait rien. Euh, et puis, j'ai appris à ne pas, ne pas aussi euh, échapper les objets. Au début, c'est facile. Si tu, je prends mon micro et je veux faire quelque chose ici, je peux le flotter, mais ça, je risque de le perdre parce qu'il va s'envoler. Alors, il faut toujours attacher les choses, il faut toujours les mettre avec un velcro ou un élastique. Ça aussi, on s'habitue. Donc, on s'habitue physiquement puis on s'habitue aussi mentalement. Un autre problème, c'est qu'on est un peu désorienté ici parce que c'est le lever de soleil 16 fois par jour et le coucher de soleil 16 fois par jour. Donc, on ne sait pas quelle heure il est spontanément. Ça, ça prend du temps avant d'habituer notre horloge euh, interne. How does the research in space help prepare to send humans for a journey in to Mars and beyond? The research we do here is mainly about how does our body adapt to li live in space and live in microgravity and live in the environment of space. And that way, we can be ready to go further. Here, it's a bit as if we were camping in our backyard. We're not very far from Earth. We can see Earth very easily. But when we are ready, then we will go to a real mountain. So in our case, we're going to Mars when we're ready to leave Earth. Because when we go to Mars, we will need to be going for several years. Right now, we're not ready for to do that. Because all the machines that are around us that keep me alive here, keep the air, keep the water, keep the... Every t so often they break and we need to fix them and we need to have stuff that's very, very reliable. So we do a lot of research on technology to keep people alive, a lot of research on technology to uh, cure diseases that happen to astronauts on orbit that also helps us on Earth, and also a, a lot of research on the energy we need to go to Mars. To go to Mars. The International Space Station shrink and expand in space to accommodate temperature extremes. Very good question. Yeah, as you know, the part of station question. that's in the yeah, sunshine you know, gets very, very warm, the part of station and the part that's, that's in, in the, the shadow gets very, very cold, and that changes and all the, part the time. That's in the shadow gets very, so, very but cold, the engineers who designed the time. space station were very so smart, and they use special materials and combinations of material that for which it doesn't matter, these uh, big changes of temperature. And thanks to that, station does not deform much. But it was a very important factor in the design of the space station. Quel était ton premier emploi et quand et pourquoi as-tu décidé de devenir astronaute par la suite? Moi, j'ai eu beaucoup d'emplois. J'ai commencé, j'étais ingénieur comme mon père et mon grand-père. Euh, après, j'ai travaillé comme astronome dans une université et dans les observatoires. Puis euh, après, je suis retourné à l'université et je suis devenu médecin. J'ai travaillé comme médecin de famille dans le Grand Nord du Canada, du Québec même, euh, dans un petit village inuit. Et c'est là que je travaillais euh, quand j'ai entendu parler euh, qu'on recrutait des astronautes. Et j'ai décidé d'essayer de, de devenir astronaute parce que c'était un vieux rêve de quand j'étais enfant. Quand j'étais petit garçon, je regardais les images de la Terre vue de l'espace et je trouvais ça tellement beau. Ça m'a... Euh, Ça m'a toujours beaucoup ému et ça m'a toujours con convaincu que c'était ce qu'il fallait faire dans la vie pour moi, c'était étudier, explorer, être un explorateur et comprendre le plus possible les choses autour de moi. Les choses autour de moi. Oui. 
What is the best and worst thing about being an astronaut? The best and worst thing? Well, the best thing about being an astronaut is that you're in space, so you can float and do anything you want. You can fly. The worst thing is that I cannot bring my family with me. I cannot bring my friends with me. I can show people photos. I can talk to you about it, but I cannot bring my friends here. So that's the worst thing. So that's the worst thing. Bonjour, David. C'est Indra de Kids Coach Jeunesse. C'est super pour nous de travailler ensemble avec vous. Et j'ai une question pour vous. Pourquoi est-il important pour les enfants de participer à un programme comme AstroPie? En fait, uh, AstroPie, c'est vraiment parfait pour s'initier à l'informatique. En fait, j'en ai un ici qui est à bord de la Station spatiale internationale. Il, joue, il fait rouler des programmes qui ont été faits par des enfants comme vous. Et c'est parfait pour s'initier. Il ne faut pas avoir peur de l'informatique, même si au début, ça peut être peut-être euh, intriguant, parce que Kids Code Jeunesse va avoir plein de conseils en ligne, des ateliers dans les musées. Puis j'ai un défi pour vous. L'an dernier, pour la première euh, étape de Astro PI, le Canada est arrivé deuxième dans le monde pour le nombre d'inscriptions. Cette année, je pense qu'on pourrait essayer d'arriver premier. Les premiers. Hi, my name is Joyce, and I'm asking a question on behalf of Zia from Manitoba. If there's one thing you'd like the bright young minds of today to know, what would it be? That's a great question. What I would like every child to know is that the future, our future, is in your heads. You are our most valuable resource. You are our hope and our future. It's all in, our future is in the minds of young people. It's their ideas and what they want to do with their own life and with the world we live in. Right now, maybe you feel very small, and you don't know much, you don't know what to do, but trust me, you are the future, and the future is whatever you want it to be. Qu'est-ce qui arrive à quelque chose qui est aspiré par un trou noir? Wow! Ça, c'est épeurant, hein? Alors, un trou noir, quand quelque chose se fait attirer par un trou noir, il ne peut pas s'échapper et il disparaît dans le trou noir. La densité, il se fait écraser, écraser, écraser jusqu'à devenir un point et il ne peut pas ressortir du trou noir. Même la lumière n'arrive pas à sortir du trou noir. C'est pour ça qu'on les appelle des trous noirs, parce qu'ils n'émettent aucune lumière. Donc, si quelque chose disparaît dans un trou noir, il est parti, disparu. Disparu. Quelle sera la chose la plus difficile à accomplir lors de votre retour sur la Terre à cause de la gravité? Ah, je pense que mon plus gros défi d'abord, le plus important, c'est de réapprendre à marcher. Ça va être difficile de marcher parce que maintenant, je suis habitué à voler et à me déplacer avec les mains surtout. Des fois, je transporte des choses avec mes pieds, mais je me déplace avec les mains. Arriver sur Terre, il va falloir que je réapprenne à marcher sans tomber, sans être malade, en tournant la tête. Ça va être le, le plus important pour moi. Après ça, bien, il va falloir que je, je réapprenne à utiliser les objets. Je ne peux pas juste les laisser flotter comme ça. Il faut que je les dépose euh, sur une table si je ne veux pas m'en servir. Ça, beaucoup d'astronautes euh, font des erreurs comme ça quand ils reviennent et ils échappent tout. Alors, je vais essayer de ne pas trop faire de gaffe. Et de pas trop faire de gaffe. À quoi ressemble le lever de soleil depuis la station spatiale? C'est très beau, en fait, parce que, on est dans, imagine ça, on est dans la nuit complète. Il fait complètement noir. 
on peut voir la Terre, on voit peut-être quelques petites lumières de ville. Et puis là, à l'horizon, on commence à voir une ligne bleue. La ligne bleue de l'atmosphère, elle devient de plus en plus brillante. Et là, il y a une ligne rouge qui s'avance au milieu, une ligne orange, jaune. Et là, pouf, le soleil apparaît, mais c'est très, très rapide. C'est comme si une lumière venait de s'allumer. C'est beaucoup plus rapide qu'un lever de soleil sur Terre. Peut-être que sur Terre, ça peut prendre une minute que le soleil sort de l'horizon et il y a des belles couleurs orange. Ici, dans l'espace, ça prend quelques secondes. On passe de la nuit complète. Pendant deux secondes, tout est orange. Et après, pouf, il fait très clair. Et ce qui est le plus bizarre, c'est que même en plein jour, avec le soleil qui est sorti, qui est dans le ciel, le ciel est noir. Le ciel est noir. How many different roles are there on board the International Space Station? Are all of them required to keep the station running? Oh, yes. Uh, well, so the way the space station works, everybody is trained to do everything. So we can all operate the equipment around us. We can all put the space suit on and do a spacewalk. We can all operate Canadarm to uh, maybe a, a catch a free-flying cargo vehicle or make a repair outside station. But there's always one commander. And so the commander has a special role. They're responsible to make decisions in case of a, an emergency. And there's also the Soyuz, uh, the spacecraft commanders for the Soyuz capsule that brought us uh, to, to space station. That's another role. So all these roles are very essential, but mostly we're all trained for many years, so we'll be interchangeable and everybody can do pretty much everything. That's what's fun about being here. Being here. Have you witnessed any unexplainable or weird things in space? Well, <laughs> often I lose things, and then I don't know where they are, and then I look for them, and I look for them, and they always appear in the same place. They always appear in an inlet of the air circulation system. I know why, of course, because the air in station is always cleaned, so it's in the air here, it, there's a little, it gets sucked into a cleaning system and then pushed back in. So anything that you lose always ends up after a few days stuck to one of those grids of the air intake of the cleaning system. So that's always kind of surprising. If you lose something, just wait two, three days, go see it there, you'll find it. Hi, I'm Lori, and I'll be asking this question on behalf of Elizabeth from Saskatchewan. How do you store food? Food here, we store it dry. We don't have refrigerators, so most of the food we have is dehydrated, like camping food. I don't know if you've had that, uh, perhaps. So it's completely dry, remove all the water, and then we just add water to it, and it becomes normal food again. We also have some food that's in cans, just in normal cans, uh, and then uh, we will warm up the can and eat it like a normal can. So that's basically the food we have. It's because we don't have a fridge and it takes a long time for delivery, we can only have food that can be kept like that on the shelf for about a year. Every so often, when we're lucky, uh, maybe we get some fresh fruits or vegetables when there's a new spacecraft that comes, but that's a very rare event, and then we have a big special meal with fresh food. Okay, so I think, do we have time for one more? One more question. It's your lucky day. Bonjour, mon nom est Matthew, et je pose cette question au nom d'Oliville de Quebec. Comment fait-on pour se laver et laver la ligne dans l'espace? Ah, pour se laver ici, évidemment, mais c'est, oui, c'est une bonne question, hein? Alors, euh, on ne peut pas prendre de douche. Hein. Imaginez qu'est-ce qui arriverait si on prenait une douche ou un bain. L'eau sortirait, ça, ça irait partout dans les machines, ça ferait des problèmes électriques. On peut pas. Alors, on se lave un peu comme on lave un bébé. On met un peu d'eau sur un bras, un bras à la fois, après de l'eau sur l'autre bras. Après, on lave une jambe, l'autre jambe, le visage, le corps. Après ça, on se sèche un morceau à la fois. Donc, on se lave un peu comme on lave un tout petit enfant. Et les vêtements, bien, les vêtements, en fait, le secret, c'est qu'on les porte très longtemps. On ne peut pas les laver. 
Donc, on les porte euh, plus longtemps qu'on les porte sur Terre. Mais ici, on dirait qu'on ne suit pas vraiment. Alors, ça ne sent pas trop mauvais. Et puis, quand, euh, quand c'est temps d'échanger, euh, on les jette. On s'en sert des fois comme matériel pour, euh, en, pour empaqueter du cargo. Empaqueter du cargo. Okay, uh, merci beaucoup, David. On behalf of everyone, I think that that's all the time we have for the link now, so we're going to bid adieu and say goodbye. Um, on behalf of all the students here at Lord Selkirk, the staff, and especially all the participants in the Astro Pi Challenge, we thank you very, very much for, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Wish you all the success and uh, a good mission uh, for the rest of your remaining four or five months in orbit. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, everybody. And don't forget to follow your dream. Reach for the stars. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you, Canadian Space Agency and participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communication. Okay, so I think that just about ends it. If, if you're curious about what that was, that's the, the Mission Control Center in Houston, which is where I normally live and work, and they talk to this thing, but it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. So it's, you guys are really lucky that you were able to talk to this, this spaceship today. Um, just as a, as a closeout here, if you, if you ever think about it, this thing's going around the Earth like every 90 minutes, and we need to maintain a direct link to it. We need to be able to see it. Of course, that's impossible to do from this school. So there's a lot that goes into a call like this. There's actually a whole array of satellites that, that are being used here. They're circling the Earth, and uh, when we get it just right and we do all the, the setup and the technology just right, they're able to pass the signal from David's microphone through a whole constellation of satellites around the Earth down to a place in central uh, United States called White Sands, over to Houston, and then up to us here. So it, just talking to the station is, is a technically marvelous feat, and I'm super happy that it worked out today. I think um, that's gonna, gonna bring the, the Q&A portion of this to an end. I reiterate once more, I wanna say thank you very much to everyone here who made this possible, the staff and the students at Lord Selkirk, um, Kids Code, Coding Jeunesse especially, and as I said before, all the participants in the Astro Pi Challenge. Uh, it's motivating for me to see your interest in coding and technology, and whatever your interests are, I just hope that, that you maintain this, this same level of interest and passion as you go forward in your lives. The future is very bright, and as David says, uh, you are the future. So thank you to everyone. If you'd like to know more about what we do, if you'd like to see more of David in space, or if you'd like more information on Astro Pi, uh, you can visit us, we're all over uh, social media. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, or the Canadian Space Agency website as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>